happy birthday you know who okay uh we are going to read or like continue with the reading of chapter 7 reading of the body keeps to score by pessel van der kolk der kolk pessel van der kolk are yeah i was right okay we are going to start or continue from part 3 the minds of children chapter 7 getting on the same wavelength attachment and attunement the roots of resilience are to be found in the sense of being understood by and existing in the mind and heart of a loving attuned and self possessed other diana fosha The children's clinic at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center was filled with disturbed and disturbing kids. They were wild creatures who could not sit still and who hit and bit other children and sometimes even after the even the staff. They would run up to you and cling to you one moment and run away terrified the next. Some masturbated compulsively, others lashed out at objects, pets and themselves. They were at once they were at once starving for affection and angry and defiant the girls in particular could be painfully compliant whether oppositional or clingy none of them seemed to able to explore or play in ways typical for children their age some of them had hardly developed a sense of self they couldn't even even recognize themselves in a mirror at the time i knew very little about children apart from what my two preschoolers were teaching me but i was fortunate in my college in my colleague nina fish murray who had studied with john piaget in geneva in addition to raising five children of her own piaget based his theories of ch- child development on meticulous direct observation of children themselves starting with his own infants and nina brought this spirit to the incipient incipient trauma center at mmhc nina was married to the former chairman of the harvard psychology department Henry Murray one of the pioneers of personality theory and she actively encouraged any junior faculty members who shared her interest she was fascinated by my stories about combat veterans because they reminded her of the troubled kids she worked with in the Boston public schools Nina's privileged position and personal charm gave us access to the children's clinic which was run by child psychiatrists who had little interest in trauma Henry Murray had among other things become famous for designing the widely used thematic aper- perception test the TAT is a so called projective test which uses a set of cards to discover how people's inner reality shapes their view of the world unlike the Rorschach cards we used with the veterans the TAT cards depict realistic but ambiguous and somewhat troubling scenes a man and a woman gloomily staring away from each other a boy looking at a broken violin Subjects are asked to tell stories about what is going on in the photo, what has happened previously and what happens next. In most cases, their interpretations quickly reveal the the themes that preoccupy them. Nina and I decided to create a set of test cards specifically for children based on pictures we cut out of magazines in the clinic waiting room. Our first study compared 12 6 two 11 year olds at the children's clinic with a group of children from a nearby hospital nearby school who matched them as closely as possible in age race intelligence and family constellation what differentiated our patients was the abuse they had suffered within their family within their families they included a boy who was severely bruised from repeated beatings by his mother a girl whose father had molested her at the age of 4 two boys who had been repeatedly tied to a chair and whipped and a girl who at the age of 5 had seen her mother a prostitute raped dismembered burned and put into the trunk of a car the mother's pimp was suspected of sexually abusing the girl the children in our control group also lived in poverty in a dep- in a depressed area of boston where they regularly witnessed shocking violence While the study was being conducted, one boy at their school threw gasoline at a classmate and sh- set him on fire. Another boy was caught in crossfire while walking to school with his father and a friend. He was wounded in the groin and his friend was killed. Given their exposure to such a high baseline level of violence, would their response to the cards differ from those of hospitalized children? One of the 
one of our cards depicted a family scene two smiling kids watching dad repair a car every every child who looked at it commented on the danger to the man lying underneath the vehicle while the control children told stories with benign endings the car would get fixed and maybe dad and kids would drive to mcdonald's the traumatized kids came up with gruesome tales One girl said that the little girl in the picture was about about to smash in her father's skull with a hammer. A 9-year-old boy who had been severely physically abused told an elaborate story about how the boy in the picture kicked away the jack so that the car mangled his father's body and his blood spurted all over the garage. As they told us these stories, our patients got very excited and disorganized. We had to take considerable time at the water cooler and go f- going for walks before we could show them the next card it was little wonder that almost all of them had been di- diagnosed with adhd and most were on ritalin through the drug though the drug certainly didn't seem to dampen their arousal in this situation the abused kids gave similar responses to a seemingly innocuous picture of a pregnant woman silhouetted against a window when we showed it to the 7 year old girl who had been sexually abused at the age of 4 she talked about penises and vaginas and repeatedly asked nina questions like how many people have you humped like several of the other sexually abused girls in the study she became so agitated that we had to stop a 7 year old girl from the control group picked up the wistful mood of the picture her story was about a widowed lady sadly looking out the window missing her husband but in the end the lady found a loving man to be good father to her baby this is the picture in card after card we saw that despite their alertness to trouble the children who had been not been abused still trusted in an essentially benign universe they could imagine ways out of bad situation they seemed to feel protected and safe within their own families they also felt loved by at least one of their parents which seemed to make a substantial difference in their eagerness to engage in school work and to learn the responses of the clinic children were alarming the most innocent images stirred up intense feelings of danger aggression sexual arousal and terror we had not selected these photos because they had some hidden meaning that sensitive people could uncover they were ordinary images of everyday life we could only conclude that for abused children the whole world is filled with triggers as long as they can imagine only disastrous outcomes to relatively benign situations anybody walking in a room any stranger any image on a screen or on a bullet billboard might be perceived as a harbinger of catastrophe in this light the bizarre behavior of the kids at the children's clinic make perfect sense to my amazement staff discussion on the unit rarely mentioned the horrific real life experiences of the children and the impact of those trauma on their feelings things thinking and self regulation instead their medical records were filled with diagnostic labels like conduct disorder or a positional defiant disorder for the angry and rebellious kids or bipolar disorder adhd was a comorbid diagnosis for almost all all was the underlying trauma being obscured by this blizzard of diagnosis now we face two big challenges one was to learn whether the different world view of normal children could account for the resilience for their resilience and on a deeper level how each individual child actually creates her map of the world the other equally crucial question was that is it possible to help the minds and brains of brutalized children to redraw their inner maps and incorporate a sense of trust and confidence in the future men without mothers The scientific study of the vital relationship between infants and their mothers was started by upper class Englishmen who were torn from their family as young boys to be sent off to boarding schools where they were raised in regimented same sex settings the first time i visited of visit the fame tavistock clinic in london i noticed a collection of black and white photographs of these great 20th century psychiatrist hanging on the wall going up the main staircase John Bowlby, Wilfred Bayon, Harry Guntrip, Ronald Fairbe- Fairbairn, and Donald Winnicott. Each of them, in his own way, we had explored how our early experiences become prototypes for all our later connections with others, and how our most intimate sense of self is created in our minute-to-minute exchanges with our caregivers. 
Scientists study what puzzles them most so that they often become experts in subjects that others take for granted. Or as the attachment researcher Beatrice BB once told me, most research is me research. These men who studied the role of mothers in children's life had themselves been sent off to a school at a vulnerable age, sometime between 6 and 10, long before they should have faced the world alone. Bolby himself told me that just such a, such boarding school experiences probably inspired George Orwell's novel 1984, which brilliantly expresses how human beings may be induced to sacrifice everything they hold dear and true, including their sense of self for the sake of being loved and approved of by someone in a position of authority. Since Bowlby was close friends with Murray's, I had a chance to talk with him about his work whenever he visited Harvard. He was born into an aristocratic family. His father was a surgeon to the king's household and he trained in psychology, medicine and psychoanalysis at the temples of the British establishment. After attending Cambridge University, he worked with delinquent boys in London East End, a notoriously rough and crime-ridden neighborhood that was largely destroyed during the Blitz. During and after his service in World War II, he observed the effects of wartime evacuation and group nurseries that separated young children from their families. He also studied the effect of hospitalization, showing that even brief separations parents back then were not allowed to visit overnight, compounded the children's suffering. By the late 1940s, Bolby had become persona non grata in the British psychoanalytic society community as a result of his radical claims that children's disturbed behavior was a response to actual life experiences, to neglect, brutality and separation rather than the product of infantile sexual fantasies. Undaunted, he devoted the rest of his life to developing what came to be called the attachment theory. A secure base. As we enter this world, we scream to announce our presence. Someone immediately engages with us, bathes us, swaddles us and fills our stomach and best of all our mother may put us on her belly or breast for delicious skin to skin contact we are profoundly social creatures our lives consist of finding our place within the community of human beings i love the expression of the great french psychiatrist pierre janet every life is a piece of art put together with all means available as we grow up, we gradually learn to take care of ourselves, both physically and emotionally, but we get our first lessons in self-care from the way that we are cared for. Mastering the skill of self-regulation depends to a large degree on how harmonious our early interactions with our caregivers are. Children whose parents are a reliable source of comfort and strength have a lifetime advantage, a kind of buffer against the worst that fate can hand them. John Bowlby realized that children are captivated by faces and voices and are exquisitely sensitive to facial expressions, posture, tone of voice, physiological changes, tempo of movement, and incipient actions. He saw this inborn capacity as a product of evolution, essential to the survival of these helpless creatures. Children are also programmed to choose one particular adult or at most a few with whom their natural communication system develops. This creates a primary attachment bond, the more responsive the adult is to the child, the deeper the attachment and the more likely the child will develop healthy ways of responding to the people around him. Bolby would often visit Regent's Park in London, where he would make systematic observations of the interactions between children and their mothers. While the mother sat quietly on park benches, knitting on or reading the paper, the kids would wander off to explore, occasionally looking over their shoulders to ascertain that mum was still watching. But when a neighbour stopped by and absorbed his mother's interest with the latest gossip, the kids would run back and stay close, making sure he still had her attention. When infants and young children notice that their mother are not fully engaged with them, they become nervous. When their mother disappears from sight, they may cry and become inconsolable, but as soon as their mother returns, they quiet down and re resume their play. Bolby saw attachment as the secure base from which a child moves out into the world. Over the subsequent five decades, research has firmly established that having a safe haven promotes self-reliance and instills a sense of sympathy and helpfulness in, to others in distress. From the intimate give and take of the attachment bond, children lean that, learn that other people have feelings and thoughts that are both similar to and different from theirs. In other words, they get in sync with their environment and with the people around them and develop the self-awareness, 
empathy, impulse control and self-motivation that makes it possible to become contributing members of the larger social culture. These qualities were painfully mixing in the uh, kids at our children's clinic. Painfully missing in the kids at our children's clinic. The dance of attunement. Children become attached to whoever functions as their pi- primary caregiver. But the nature of that attachment, whether it is secure or insecure, makes a huge difference over the course of a child's life. Secure attachment develops when caregiving includes emotional attunement. Emotional attunement. Attunement starts at the most subtle physical levels of interaction between babies and their caregivers. And it gives babies the feeling of being met and understood. As Edinburgh-based attachment research Colvin... Srivartham says, the brain coordinates rhythmic body movements and guides them, guides them to act in sympathy with other people's brain. Infants hear and listen, learn musicality from their mother's talk even before birth. In chapter 4, I describe the discovery of mirror neurons, the brain-to-brain link that gives us our capacity to, for empathy. Mirror neurons start functioning as soon as babies are born. When researchers, when researcher Andrew, sorry, yeah. When researcher Andrew Mezov at the University of Oregon pursued his lips or sucked, stuck out his tongue at six hours old babies, they promptly mirrored his actions. Newborns can focus their eyes only on objects within eight to twelve inches, just enough to see the pres- person who is holding them. Imitation is our most fundamental social skill. It assures that we automatically pick up and reflect the behavior of our parent, teacher and peers. Most parents relate to their babies so spontaneously that they are barely aware of how attunement unfolds. But an invitation from from a friend, the attachment researcher Ed Tronick, gave me the chance to observe that process more closely through a one-way mirror at Harvard's Laboratory of Human Development. I watched a mother playing with her two-month-old son who was propped in an infant seat facing her. They were cooing to each other and having a wonderful time until the mother learned into a, leaned into the nuzzle, in to nuzzle him and the baby in his excitement yanked on her hair. The mother was caught unawares and yelped with pain, pushing away his hand while her face comforted with anger. The baby let go immediately and they pulled back physically from each other. For both of them, the source of delight had become a source of distress. Obviously frightened, the baby brought his hand up to his face to block out the side of his angry mother. The mother, in turn, realizing that her baby was upset, refocused on him, making soothing sounds in an attempt to smooth things over. The infant still had his eyes covered, but his craving for connection soon re-emerged. He started pecking peeking out to see if the coast was clear when his mother reached towards him with a concerned expression. As she started to tickle his belly, belly, he dropped his arm and broke into a happy giggle, and harmony was re-established. Infant and mother were attuned again. This entire sequence of delight, rupture, repair, and new delight took slightly less than 12 seconds. Tronic and other researchers have now shown that when infants and caregivers are in sync on an emotional level, they are also in sync physically. Babies can't regulate their emotional states, much less the changes in heart rate, hormone levels and nervous system activity that accompany emotions. When a child is in sync with his caregiver, his sense of joy and connection is reflected in his steady heartbeat and breathing and a low level of stress hormones. His body is calm, so are his emotions. The moment he, his this movie is disrupted, as is often as it often is in the course of normal day, all these physiological factors changes as well. You can tell equilibrium has been restored when the physiology calms down. We soothe newborns, but parents soon start teaching their children to tolerate higher levels of arousal, a job that is often assigned to fathers. I once heard the psychological John Gottman say, "Mothers stroke and fathers poke." Learning how to manage arousal is a key life skill and parents must do it for babies before babies can do it for themselves. If that gnawing sensation in his belly makes a baby cry, the breast or bottle arrives. If he's scared, someone holds and rocks him until he calms down. If the bubble interrupts, someone comes to make him clean and dry. Associating intense sensation with safety, comfort and mastery is the foundation of self-regulation self-soothing and self-nurture, a theme to which I return throughout this book. 
a secure attachment combined with the cultivation of completely complete competency builds an internal locus of control the key factor in healthy coping throughout life securely attached and children lean attached children learn that what makes them feel good they discover what makes them and others feel bad and they acquire a sense of agency that their actions can change how they feel and how others respond securely attached kids learn the difference between situations they can control and situations where they need help they learn that they can play an active role when faced with difficult situations in contrast children with histories of abuse and neglect learn that their terror pleading and crying do not register with their caregivers nothing they can do or say stop the beating or bring attention and help in effect they are being called conditioned to give up when they face challenges later in life becoming real just bolby's contemporary the pediatrician and psychoanalyst donald winnicott is the father of modern studies of attunement His minute observations of mothers and children started with the way mothers hold their babies. He proposed that these physical interactions lay the groundwork for a baby's sense of self and with that a lifelong sense of identity. The way a mother holds her child underlies the ability to feel the body as the place where their psyche lives. The visceral and the kinesthetic sensations of how our bodies are met lays the foundation for what we experience as real. Winnicott thought that the vast majority of mothers did just fine in their attunement to their infants it does not require extraordinary talent to be what is called he called a good enough mother but things can go seriously wrong when mothers are unable to tune in to their body's baby's physical reality if a mother cannot meet her baby's impulse and needs the baby learns to become the mother's idea of what the baby is having to discount is its inner sensations and trying to adjust to its caver gives need means the child perceives that something is wrong with the way it is children who lack physical attunement are vulnerable to shutting down the direct feedback from their bodies and seat of pleasure purpose and direction in these years since bolby's and winnicott's ideas were introduced attachment research around the world has shown that the vast majority of children are securely attached when they grow up their history of reliable responsive caregiving with will help to create keep fear and anxiety at bay barring exposure to some overwhelming life event trauma that breaks down the self regulatory system they will maintain a fundamental state of emotional security throughout their life secure attachment also forms a template for children's relationship they pick up what others are feeling and early on learn to tell a game from reality and they develop a good nose for phony situations or dangerous people securely attached children usually become pleasant playmates and have lots of self affirming experiences with their peers having learned to be in tune with other people they tend to notice subtle changes in their voices and faces to adjust their behavior accordingly they learn to live within a shared understanding of the world and are likely to become valued members of the community this upward spiral can however be reversed by abuse or neglect abuse kids are often very sensitive to changes in voices and faces but they tend to respond to them as threats rather than as cues for staying in sync dr seth pollock of the university of wisconsin showed a series of faces to a group of normal 8 year olds and compared their responses with those of eight group abused children of the same age looking at the spectrum of angry to sad expressions the abused kids were hyper alert to the slightest feature of anger copyright american psychological association 2000 This is one reason abused children so easily become defensive or scared. Imagine what it's like to make your way through a sea of sea of faces in the school corridor trying to figure out what might assault you, who might assault you, children who overreact to their peers' aggression, who do not pick up on other kids' needs, who easily shut down or lose control of their impulses, are likely to be shunned and left out for of sleepovers or play dates. Eventually they may learn to cover up their fear by putting up a tough front. or may they may spend more and more time alone watching tv or playing computer games feeling even further during behind on interpersonal skills and emotional self regulation the need for attachment never lessens most human beings simply cannot tolerate being disengaged from others for any length of time 
people who cannot connect through work friendship or family usually finds other ways of bondings as through illness lawsuits or family feuds anything is preferable to the good god for sake and sense of crisp sense of irrelevance and alienation a few years ago on christmas eve i was called to examine a 14 year old boy at the suffolk country jail county jail jack had been arrested to breaking into the house of neighborhood neighbors who were away at vac- vacation the burglar alarm was howling when the police found him in the living room the question asked i the first question i asked jack was who he expected would visit him in jail on christmas nobody he told me nobody ever pays attention to me it turns out that he had been caught during dark ins numerous nine times before he knew the police and they knew him with delight in his voice he told me that when the cops saw him standing them in the middle of the living room they yelled oh my god it's jack again that little motherfucker somebody recognized him somebody knew his name a little while later jack confessed you know that is what it what makes it worthwhile kids will go to the almost any length to feel seen and connected living with the peer- parents you have children have a biological instinct to attach they have no choice whether their parents or caregivers are loving and caring or distant insensitive rejecting or abusive children will develop a coping style based on their attempts to get us at least some of their needs met We now have reliable ways to assess and identify these coping styles thanks largely to the works of two American scientists Mary Ainsworth and Mary Main and their colleagues who concluded thousands of research of hours of observation of mother infant pairs over many years based on these studies Ainsworth created a research tool called the strain situation which looks at how an infant reacts to temporary separation from the mother just as balby had observed securely attached infants are distressed when their mother leaves but they they show delight when she returns and after a brief check in from for reassurances they settle down and resume their place but with infants who are insecurely attached the picture is more complex Children whose primary caregiver is unresponsive or rejecting learn to deal with their anxiety in two distinct ways. The researcher noticed that some, some seemed chronically upset and demanding with their mothers, while others were more passive and withdrawn. In both groups, contact with the mothers failed to settle them down. They did not return to play contentedly as happened at secure attachment. In one pattern called avoidant attachment the infant look like nothing really bothers them they don't cry when their mother goes away and they ignore when they she comes back however this does not mean that they are unaffected in fact their chronically increased heart rate shows that they are in a constant state of hyperarousal my colleague and i call these patterns dealing with dealing but not feeling Most mothers of avoidant infants seem to dislike touching their children. They have trouble smuggling, snuggling and holding them and they don't use their facial expressions and voices to create pleasure back and forth rhythms with their babies. In other patterns called anxious or ambivalent attachment, the infants constantly draw attention to themselves by crying, yelling, clinging or screaming. They are feeling but not dealing. They seem to have concluded that unless they make a spectacle nobody is going to pay attention to them. They become enormously upset when they do not know what their mother is but when they when they do not know where their mother is but de- derive little comfort from her return and even though they don't seem to enjoy her company they stay passively or aggressively focused on her even in situations when other children would rather play. Attachment researchers think that the three organized attachment strategies secure avoidant and anxious work because they elicit the best care a particular caregiver is capable of providing infants who encounter a consistent pattern of care even if it's marked by emotional distance or insensitivity can adopt adapt to maintain their relationship that does not mean that there are no problems attachment patterns often persist into adulthood anxious toddlers anxious toddlers tend to grow into anxious adults while avoidant toddlers are likely to become adults who are out of touch with their own feelings and those of others as in there's nothing wrong with the good spanking i got hit and it made me the successful success i am today i in school avoidant children are likely to bully other children 
while the anxious children are often their victims. However, development is not linear and many life experiences can intervene to change these situations. But there is another group that is less stably adapted, a group that makes up the bulk of the children we treated and a substantial proportion of the adults who are seen in psychiatric clinics. Some 20 years ago, Mary Main and her colleague at Berkeley began to identify a group of children, about 15% of those they studied, who seemed to be unable to figure out how to engage with their caregivers. The critical issue turned out to be that caregivers themselves were a source of distress or terror to the child. Children in this situation have no one to turn to when they are faced with an unsolvable dilemma. Their mothers are simultaneously necessary for survival and a source of fear. They can neither approach the secure and ambivalent strategies, shift their tr attention, the avoiding strategy, nor flee if you observe such children in a nursery school or attachment laboratory. You see them look towards their parents when they enter the room and then quickly turn away. Unable to choose between seeking closeness and avoiding the parent, they may rock on their hand and knees, appear to go into a trance, freeze with their arms raised or get up to greet their parents and then fall to the ground, not knowing who is safe or whom they belong to. They may be intensif intensely affectionate with strangers or may trust nobody. Main call their pattern, disorganized attachment and disorganized attachment is fright without solution. Becoming disorganized within. Conscious, conscientious parent often become alarmed when they discover attachment research, worrying that this occasional impatience or their ordinary lapses in attunement may permanently damage their kids. In real life, there are bound to be misunderstandings, inept responses and failures of miscommunication, but because fathers and mothers miscues or are simply preoccupied with other, other matters, Infants are frequently left to their own devices to discover how they can themselves down, calm themselves down within limits. This is not a problem. Kids need to learn to handle frustration and disappointments with good enough caregivers. Children learn that the broken connection can be required, can be repaired. The is critical issue is whether they can incorporate a feeling of being viscerally safe with their parents or other caregivers. In study of attachment patterns in two, over 2,000 infants in normal middle class environment, 62% were found to be secure, 15% avoidant, 9% anxious, also known as ambivalent, and 15% disorganized. Intensely, this large study showed that the children's gender and basic temperament have little effect on attachment style. For example, children with difficult temperaments are not more likely to develop a disorganized style. Kids from lower socioeconomic group are more likely to be diagnosed disorganized with parents often severely stressed with economic and family instability. Children who don't feel safe in infancy have trouble regulating their moods and emotional responses as they grow older. Older, by kindergarten, many disorganized infants are either aggressive or spaced out and disengaged, and they go on to develop a range of psychiatric problems. They also show more psychological stress as expressed in heart rate, heart vulnerability, heart vulnerability, heart rate variability, stress hormone responses, and lowered immune system factors. Does this kind of biological dysregulation automatically reset to a normal to normal as a child mature is moved to a safe environment? So far as we know, it does not. People abuse is not the only cause of disorganized attachment. P parents who are preoccupied with their trauma, such as domestic abuse or rape or these recent call of a parent sibling, may also be took emotionally stab unstable and inconsistent to offer too much offer and protection when while all parents to be all parents need to the need while all parents need all the help they can get to raise Secure children, traumatized parents particular and need to be attuned to their environment in their child's need. Caregivers often don't realize that they are not of tune. I vividly remember a videotape Betrick Bebe showed me. It featured a young man playing with a three-month-old infant. Everyone, Everything was going well until the baby pulled out 
pulled back and turned his head away signaling that he needed a break but the mother did not pick up on his cue he intensified her efforts to engage him by bringing her face close to his and increasing to scream increasing the volume of her voice when he recorded even more when he recoiled even more she kept bouncing and poking him finally she started to scream at which point the mother put down the mother put him down and walked away looking classification of emissive attach attunement repeated over and over again can gradually lead to a chronic disconnection anyone who's raised a cocky colicky or hyperactive baby knows how quickly stress rises when nothing seems to make a difference chronically failing to calm her baby down and especially an enjoyable face to face interaction the mother is likely to come to perceive him as a difficult child who makes her feel like a failure and give up on trying to comfort her child in practice it is often difficult to distinguish the problems that result from disorganized attachment from those that result from trauma they are often intertwined my colleague rachel yahood studied areas of ptsd in adult new york new yorkers who had been assaulted or raped Those whose mothers were Holocaust survivors with PTSD had significantly higher rates of developing serious psychological problems after a vulnerable physiology, making it difficult for them to regain their equilibrium after being violated. Yehuda found a similar jewelry in the children's children of pregnant women who were in the whole trade world trade center that fat fatal day in two thousand one. Similarly the reactions of children to painful events are largely determined by how calm or stressed their parents are my former student glen six now chairman of the department of child and adolescent psychiatry at nyu showed that when children are hospitalized for treatment of severe burns the develop the development of ptsd could be predicted by how safely they felt with how safe they felt with their mother the security of their their attachment to their mother and predicted the amount of morphine that was required control their pain the more secure the attachment the less painkiller was released another colleague claude came out came to who directs the family trauma research program at nyu langone medical center studied 112 new york city children who had directly witnessed the terrorists were 6 times more likely to have significant emotional problems and 11 times more likely to be problems as well but shembot shemtop discovered that this effect was indirect and was transmitted via their mother living with an irascible withdrawn or terrified spouse is likely to impose a major psychological burden on the partner including depression if you have no internal sense of security it is difficult to distinguish between safety and danger If you feel chronically numbed out, potentially dangerous situations may make you feel alive. If you conclude start expecting other people to treat you horribly, you probably deserve it and anyway there's nothing you can do about it. When this organized people carry self-perception like these, they are set up to be traumatized by subsequent exp- experiences. The long-term effect of disorganized attachment. <laughs> In the early 1980s my colleague Carlin Leons Ruth a Harvard attachment researcher began to videotape face to face interaction between mothers and their infants at 6 month old 12 month old and 18 month old 18 or 8 okay what 18 months she taped them again when the children were 5 year old and once more when they were 7 or 8 All were from high-risk families. Hundred percent met federal poverty guidelines, and almost half the mother were single parents. Disorganized attachment showed up in two different ways. One group of mothers seemed to be too preoccupied with her own issues to attend to their infant. They were often intrusive and hostile. They, they alternated between rejecting their infants and as, acting as if they expected them to respond to their needs. Another group of mothers seemed helpless and fearful. They often came across as sweet and fragile, but they didn't know how to be the adults in the relationship and seemed to want their children to comfort them. They failed to greet their children after having been away and did not pick up when while we did not pick up while we picked them up when the children were distressed. 
The mother didn't seem to be doing these things deliberately. They simply didn't know how to be attuned to their kids and respond to their cues and thus failed to comfort and reassure them. The hostile or intrusive mothers were more likely to be to have childhood histories of physical abuse and of, of witnessing domestic violence while the withdrawn or developed dependent mothers were more likely to have histories of sexual abuse or parental loss but not physical abuse. I have always wondered how parents come to abuse their kids. After all, raising healthy offspring is at the very core of my human sense of purpose and meaning what could arrive per what could drive parents to deliberately hurt or neglect their children. Carlin's research provided me with one answer. Watching her videos, I could see the children becoming more and more inconsolable, sullen, resistant to their misattuned mothers. At the same time the mothers became increasingly frustrated defeated and helpless in their interaction once the mother comes to see the child not as a part- partner in an attuned relationship but as a first frustrating and raging disconnected stranger the stage is set for subsequent abuse about 18 years later when this these kids were around 20 years old leon ruth did a follow up study to see how they were coping In infants with seriously disrupted emotional communication patterns with their mothers at 18 months grew up to become young adults with an unstable sense of self self damaging impulsivity including excessive spending promiscuous sex substance abuse reckless driving and binge eating inappropriate and intense angry intense anger and recurrent social suicidal behavior Carlin and her colleagues had expected that hostile or intrusive behavior on the part of the mothers would be the most powerful predictor of mental instability in their adult children but they discussed otherwise emotional withdrawal had the most powerful profound and long lasting impact emotional distance and role reversal in which mother expect the chi- child to look after them were specifically linked to aggressive behavior against self and others in the young adult dissociation knowing and not knowing leon ruth was particularly interested in the phenomena of dissociation which is manifested in feeling lost overwhelmed abandoned and disconnected from the world and in seeing oneself as unsolved unloved empty helpless trapped and weighed down she found a striking and unexpected relationship between maternal and disengagement and misentunement during the first two years of life and dissociative symptoms in early adulthood leon roth concludes that infant who are not truly seen and known by their mothers are at high risk to grow into adolescents who are unable to know and to see infants who live in secure relationship learn to communicate not only their frustration and distress but also their emerging selves their interests their preferences and goals receiving a sympathetic response cushions infants and adults against extreme levels of frightened arousals but if your caregiver ignore your needs or resent you for your very existence you learn to anticipate rejection and withdrawal you cope as well as you can by blocking out your mother's hostility or neglect and act as if it doesn't matter but your body is likely to remain in a state of high alert prepared to ward off blows deprivation or abandonment dissociation means simultaneously knowing and not knowing Bolby wrote what cannot be communicated to the mother cannot be communicated to the self if you cannot tolerate what you know or feel what you feel and the only option is denial and dissociation maybe the most devastating long term effect of this shutdown not fe- is not feeling real inside a condition we saw in the kids in the children's clinic and that we see in the children and adult who come to the trauma center when you don't feel real nothing matters which makes it impossible to protect yourself from danger or you may resort to extremes in an effort to feel something even cutting yourself with a razor blade or getting into fist fights with strangers carlin research carlin's research showed that dissociation is learned early later abuse or other traumas did not account for dissociative y- symptoms in young adults abuse and trauma accounted for many other problems but not for chronic dissociation or aggression against self the critical underlying issues was that these patients didn't know how to feel safe lack of safety within the early caregiving relationships led to an impaired sense of inner reality excessive clinging and self damaging behavior 
poverty, single parenthood, or maternal psychiatric symptoms did not predict these these symptoms. This does not imply that child abuse is irrelevant, but that the quality of early caregiving is critically important in preventing mental health problems, independent of other traumas. For that reason, treatment needs to address only the imprints of specific trauma event, but also the consequences of not having been mirrored. attuned to when given consent care consistent care and affection dissociation and loss of self regulation restoring synchrony early attachment patterns create the inner maps that chart our relationship throughout life not only in terms of what we expect from others but also in terms of how much comfort and pleasure we can experience in their presence i i doubt that the poet e e cummings could have written in his his joyous lines i like my body body when it is with your body muscles better and nerves more if his earlier earliest experiences had been frozen faces and hostile glances our relationship maps are implicit etched into the emotional brain and not reversible simply by understanding how they were created you may realize that your fear of intimacy has something to do with your mother's postpartum depression or with the fact that she herself was molested as a child but that alone is unlikely to open you to happy trusting engagement with others however the realization may help you to start exploring other ways to connect in relationships both for your own sake and in order to not pass on an insecure attachment to your own children In part 5 I'll discuss a number of approaches to healing damaged attunement system through training in rhythmicity and reciprocity being in sync with oneself and with others require integration of our body based senses vision hearing touch and balance if this does not happen in infants infancy and early childhood there is an increased chance of later sensory integration problems to which trauma and neglect are by no means the only pathways Being in sync means resonating through sounds and movements that connect which are embedded in the daily sensory rhythms of cooking and cleaning going to bed and waking up being in sync may mean sharing funny faces and hugs expressing delight or disapproval at the right movements movements losing balls back and forth or singing together at the trauma center we have developed programs to coach parents in connection and attunement and my patients have be told me about many other ways to get to themselves in sync ranging from chalk choral singing and ballroom dancing to joining basketball teams jazz bands and chamber music groups all of these foster a sense of attunement and common pleasure chapter 8 since i am very sleepy i literally am and i know that we haven't read for one hour but let's end it we'll continue from chapter 8 tomorrow i hope it was clear i will be uploading this on youtube like always and all the previous recordings are also available on youtube the previous chapters of the same book and the other books are also there in youtube and if you are just following me on twitch or watching me on twitch live then you should just definitely check out youtube channel and check out the recordings that are available and if you have missed anything if you need me to read something else if you want to give me feedback recommendations suggestions all is welcome i am stopping the recording